Hi everyone, I hope you're all well and having a great week. Thank you for coming to our webinar. My name is Will and today's webinar is entitled Understanding Prebiotics in 2022 and Beyond. Now this webinar will explore meaningful insights into the consumer's view of prebiotics and explore why prebiotics can tap into the needs of growing audiences who are looking to address their health and well-being. Now, if you have any questions throughout both presentations, you can find the question box on your control panel. Now, please feel free to type in your questions and submit them, and we can go through all questions once both presentations have been completed. Now, remember, when asking a question, please address who the question is for. Now, today we are joined by Mike Hughes, Head of Research and Insights at FMCG Gurus, and Antje John claus Head of Nutrition Communication at Benio. So I would now like to pass you on to Mike Hughes, who will take us away with our first presentation. Hi, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're dialing in from. My name is Mike Hughes, and I am Head of Research and Insights at FMCG Gurus. Today's presentation is entitled Understanding the Prebiotic Market in 2022 and Beyond. This presentation will last approximately 15 to 20 minutes and will be available for distribution after the event. Alternatively, you can contact us directly for a copy at info at fmcggurus.com. This presentation is going to look at how consumers are taking a holistic and proactive approach to health. We'll also look at how consumers are aware of the digestive health system and the link that it has on overall health and wellness. We'll explore the extent that consumers are aware of prebiotics, the extent that they're seeking them out, in what food, food and drink categories they like to see such options, and what type of claims that they see. So over the last couple of years, we know that consumers have taken a long-term approach to health and wellness. This is a result of COVID-19. Initially, consumers were very worried about the virus. They didn't know anything about it, and as such, they couldn't assess their risk factors. However, as time progressed, consumers learned to live with the virus and adopted a broader approach to wellness. They also recognized that one of the reasons that they were so concerned about the virus was because their diets and lifestyles were not as healthy as they should be, something that increased the risk of long-term health problems such as cancer. As a result of this, consumers took a proactive approach to health and focused on prevention over cure, educating them more about the topic of wellness. As a result of this, they took a greater interest in ingredients in food and drink that are known to boost health. This is something that drives demand for products such as functional food, drinks and supplements that blur the boundaries between traditional groceries and medicine. We know over the next couple of years, consumers will continue to take a proactive approach to health. Consumers are seeing a positive response to these levels of proactiveness, and this is something that will continue to do so in the future. Over the next 12 months, continue, consumers will continue to take a proactive approach to health maintenance. Now, despite the high levels of uncertainty that consumers have faced, over the last couple of years, and many consumers becoming more conscious about vulnerability to disease and illness. We know that almost half of all consumers say that they feel their health has improved over the last couple of years. This is a real positive for the health and wellness industry, and it shows that consumers will be encouraged to continue with their health goals. Now, over the next 12 months, we know that consumers want to address a variety of health issues. Priority will be on boosting the immune system, this shows that health goals are still very much focused on disease management and minimizing vulnerability to disease and illness. For instance, we know that consumers continue to be very concerned about exposure to germs, viruses and bacteria across a variety of areas. Digestive health is also a priority for many consumers. We know that consumers are recognizing the link between digestive health and overall wellness. However, at the same time, digestive health problems continue to become common across the globe. This can be for various factors. For instance, we know that society is aging, and as a result of that, consumers can suffer from problems such as difficulty digesting food. However, we also know that digestive health problems are something that can often be self-inflicted. For instance, having poorly structured dietary habits, irregular mealtime patterns, overindulging, eating directly before bedtime, 
all of this is something that can result in digestive health becoming more common. And these are key areas that consumers are looking to address. It's also worth quickly noting that in an area of, area of uncertainty, emotional wellness is something that consumers are also looking to address, wanting to improve their cognitive and mental health. Now, consumers are either aware of the gut microbiome or want to know more about it. FMCG Guru's research shows that three quarters of consumers say that they recognize the link between their digestive health and their immune health. This shows that consumers recognize that problems such as bloating, constipation, irregular bowel movement aren't something that just can cause feelings of embarrassment, the ability to relax or impact quality of life but are actually something that can have an impact on long-term illness, on, on long-term wellness and increase vulnerability to illness in the long-term, something that misaligns with the concepts of healthy aging. Now, one of the reasons why consumers are placing greater urgency on addressing gut health is that because one or two consumers have either heard of the gut microbiome or are aware of bacteria within the guts that is beneficial to their health. Now, FMCG gurus often gets asked, how aware of consumers of the microbiome and responses can vary in terms of how much consumers have actually heard the phrase the gut microbiome. However, what's more important is that consumers recognize the underlying concept of the importance of beneficial bacteria in the gut. And in the long term, this is something that will drive demand for products that support the growth of beneficial bacteria in the gut. Now we know the prebiotic market is growing. It's a very exciting time. And I think it's fair to say that this market has grown considerably over the last 10 years, when it was a phrase that was relatively unknown. So now we see a variety of new product development across different food and drink product categories. And we also see prebiotic products in supermarkets, in convenience stores, and in the food service sector. Over one in two consumers say that they have heard of the phrase prebiotics, with this level of awareness being the highest in Asia Pacific. We also know that of those consumers who have heard of the phrase prebiotic, a considerable proportion of consumers say that they have purchased the product in the last 12 months. This shows that it's not a niche product, but a major product and something that will only continue to grow as more urgency is placed on gut health. Now, one of the benefits is that the market is still very much in its infancy, which means that there's an opportunity for brands to further raise awareness of the specific benefits of prebiotic products. For instance, 77% of global consumers who purchase prebiotics say that they've been doing so for less than two years, meaning they're relatively new to the market and as such will be more open to a greater range of new product development across different product categories. Moreover, 28% of consumers who say that they do not purchase prebiotics, say they have not seen them available. This shows that consumers don't feel that they need, don't need the product, but what it does show is that consumers simply do not know where to find these products, which again showing that if you can increase the range, availability and presence of prebiotic products, this is a market that will grow considerably over the next couple of years. Now, consumers who have heard of prebiotics say that they prefer products in food and drink form. We asked consumers who said that they have heard of prebiotics, what kind of ingredients do, do they most associate with this type of product? And the two most popular answers were chicory root fiber and inulin. When they were asked what type of probiotic, prebiotic applications do they prefer, consumers were most likely to say food and drink. This is because consumers prefer food and drink because it's associated with being natural, tastier, more affordable, and more convenient. Meaning these products are easy to incorporate into daily diets, be whether it's part of a structured diet plan or consumers picking up impulse purchases as part of a convenient nutritional boost. And again, this shows the opportunity to extend the range of new product development of prebiotics beyond those traditional categories associated with the market. What we do see is that one in four consumers who have heard of prebiotics say that they prefer nutritional supplements. And FMCG Gurus believes that there'll be a big growth area in nutritional supplements where the format is one that replicates the food and drink markets such as candies, jellies and gummies.
Now, consumers are taking a prevention over cure approach to health and wellness. And as mentioned earlier on in the presentation, we know that health goals are very much focused on disease management. This means that consumers are looking to address areas of health and wellness, such as immunity and digestive health, even if they're not suffering any symptoms and are actually satisfied with that level of wellness, with greater focus on prevention over cure. And again, this is a real positive for the prebiotic market. One in two consumers who say that they've purchased prebiotics in the last 12 months say that they were not showing any symptoms when they turned to these products. This means that they were not taking a reactive approach to health. They were not turning to these products because they were recommended to do so by a medical expert, but instead they were self-educating themselves about health, taking a proactive approach to wellness and seeking out functional products that they associate with aiding overall general health and wellness. Now, when taking a proactive approach to health, consumers turn to products as a part of the daily diet, meaning that they'll want products that they feel that they can be easily incorporated into their daily routines. And another positive that we'll see towards the end of the presentation is that if consumers feel that products are having a positive impact and that they feel the benefits of these products, they will continue to purchase them. And that's something that will be particularly important in a cost of living crisis that we'll see over the next 12 months when consumers have to make priorities of what they purchase and what they associate with good value. Now, consumers are turning to prebiotics to aid their overall health and wellness. And again, this shows how consumers are embracing the concept of holistic health, realizing that all aspects of health are interlinked and impact on each other. Overall, consumers are most want to see claims around supporting immune health and digestive health on prebiotics. This shows that many consumers recognize that these two issues are interlinked and crucial for minimizing vulnerability to disease and illness. However, the fact that consumers are most likely are also particularly likely to want to see benefits around improving general well-being shows that consumers want to see multifunctional benefits on products. This is something that's associated with maximum efficacy, maximum convenience, and maximum value for money. And the reality is that many consumers do not have the time, the inkling, or the financial capability to seek out specific products for specific health solutions. And as such, if they see a myriad of claims on a product, it's something that will appeal to them. At the same time, and as we'll discuss on the next slide, brands need to back up any health claims made with scientific evidence. And finally, it's also important to say that as well as consumers wanting to see a variety of multifunctional benefit claims on products, they also want reassurance that products contain only real and authentic ingredients and don't contain any artificial ingredients that are deemed detrimental to their health or the wider environment. Now, one thing that the health and wellness market cannot ignore over the next 12 months is the cost of living crisis that's occurring throughout the globe. We know that relatively few households have sufficient savings. That means many households live month to month and any downturn in the economy, increases in prices, or deterioration in finan financial wellness is something that will hit many people hard and fast. As a result of this, consumers will adopt recessionary style spending habits. They'll put greater emphasis on what's value for money and have to make more shrewd decisions about what they purchase and what they don't purchase. However, a real positive for the health and wellness market is that consumers feel that changes to their diets and their lifestyles over the last couple of years are having a positive impact. And as they focus on healthy aging, they'll continue to seek out health and wellness products that they associate with maximum value for money. When buying prebiotic food and drink products, 76% of consumers say that product efficacy is important. This shows that in the prebiotic market, wants to demonstrate maximum value for money, they need to provide scientific evidence to back up health claims being made. Indeed, it's not a lot enough to simply say what a product does. Brands need to prove it. And a real positive for the prebiotic market is over half of all consumers who have purchased a product in the last 12 months feel that it's having a benefit on their health and wellness, meaning that they'll be encouraged to continue to purchase in the future even in a cost of living crisis. So to conclude, consumers continue to take a proactive approach to health, 
meaning that they are being attentive to functional products and ingredients. Although immunity and digestive health are a priority, a holistic approach to wellness means that consumers want to see a variety of health claims on products. And consumers are focusing on prevention over cure, meaning they're looking to address areas of wellness, even if not suffering from symptoms. Now, most consumers have heard of prebiotics, and there is a potential to grow the market across a variety of product categories, especially food and drink. Rising awareness of the gut microbiome will be benefit, beneficial for the prebiotic market. Efficacy is a priority when choosing prebiotics, and the good news for the market is that consumers who use these products deem them effective. Scientific evidence is needed to support claims being made. And consumers also want to avoid chemical ingredients when seeking out prebiotic products. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. I would now like to pass you on to our next speaker. Thank you, Mike. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to this second presentation of the webinar. Uh, my name is Antje Jungklaus. I'm Head of Nutrition Communication at Benio, and I'm very excited to be here today and talk to you about the gut microbiome and digestive health and which unique role prebiotic chicory root fibers can play. In fact, I was delighted to hear from Mike's presentation that there is a rising consumer awareness about the gut microbiome and that consumers link prebiotic products with benefits for digestive health, immune health, and general well-being. So this gives us great opportunities today for the marketing of prebiotic foods and drinks with appealing messages, whereby we heard from Mike as well that it's important to consumers that efficacy and health messages are backed by science. So in my presentation, I will take the science-based view on the prebiotic benefits uh, with respect to the question also how to bring it into trustworthy prebiotic food and drink products uh, and applications. So let me take you on a journey to explore what we know today about the gut microbiome and its physiological functions, interactions and relevance to human health. How a healthy gut microbiota can be supported with prebiotics and which unique role prebiotic chicory root fibers can play in this. Let's start this journey with a closer look at the gut microbiome and its relevant to human health. We should see the, uh, the microbiome, in fact, as a new organ to support, and I would like to explain you why. When we talk about the gut microbiome, we refer to the community of microorganisms in the gut, what we call the gut microbiota, and we refer to the ecosystem they live in, so namely the colon. And this is taking a broader perspective than the gut microbiota itself. The gut microbiota is composed of microorganisms that include bacteria as the most relevant ones, but also fungi, algae and others. And uh, the microbiota closely uh, interacts with the gut environment and with different organs of the human body via microbial metabolites. And these interactions has an influence on human health and well-being. So, my, uh, so in other words, keeping the microbiota in balance is important for our health and well-being. So microorganisms can be helpful and beneficial to the human body, like for instance bifidobacteria or lactobacilli, or they can be harmful and promote diseases, uh, like for instance infections with Clostridium difficile. In a healthy state, there's a coexistence of pathogens, neutral and beneficial bacteria. Uh, and if this balance is disturbed, however, then we have a state of dysbiosis occurring, and this is more often linked with uh, a higher risk of diseases. So if we take a closer look, the gut and the gut microbiota plays a role in many important functions of the body. The gut is not just there for the digestion process and final excretion of the face, it is also an important place for hormone production. An important part of our nervous system is based on the gut, and therefore it's also called our second brain. Further, a major part, about 70% of, of our immune system is based on the gut. And the gut wall is a barrier between the outside world, what we take in, for instance, with food that we eat, digest and absorb, and the inside world, that is our blood circulation and metabolism and what we have inside. 
So beneficial bacteria such as bifidobacteria can support these gut and body functions in many ways. For instance, uh, by producing vitamins or short-chain fatty acids from the breakdown of undigested carbohydrates in the colon, or by supporting the intestinal immune system and fighting for inner defense or by producing other metabolites that might function as signals or messengers in the communication with the brain via the gut-brain X or within the hormonal system, or by protecting the gut barrier and defending against pathogens. On the other hand, imbalances in the gut microbiota and dysbiosis have been linked with a number of diseases in literatures, uh, such as asthma and allergy, infections, colic and uh, functional gastrointestinal disorders in infants, inflammatory bowel disorders, autism, and so on. And also low numbers of bifidobacteria are linked to several disease risk associations. Uh, and here we see type 2 diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerate of colitis, Crohn's disease, celiac disease, or obesity and metabolic disorders. So while it is evident that a balanced microbiota is key for health and well-being uh, also for us, the question is now how can we actually support a balanced microbiota with a particular support of beneficial bacteria? Well, in fact, this question is not new. new. This question has been addressed by researchers over 20 years ago in Europe and it has given birth to the prebiotic concept. The idea of this is uh, that uh, we can feed our natural microbiota with prebiotics. So in simple words, prebiotics are food components like dietary fibers or chicory root, which the human body cannot access, but instead they can feed our beneficial bacteria and thereby selectively support the growth of those good bacteria, mainly beef bacteria. So, Benil, formerly known as Orafti, has pioneered and supported the research of the prebiotic concept since the very beginning in 1995. And back then, observations on shifts in the microbiota, such as a selective growth of bifidobacteria when consuming chicory root fibers, led to the birth of the prebiotic concept by researchers in Belgium, around Professor Robert and by researchers in the UK uh, around Professor Blaine Gibson over 20 years ago. So over the years, the prebiotic definition has been reviewed several times by International Scientific Association for Probiotics and Prebiotics, in short ICEP, to reflect the development in science. Meanwhile, the concept of prebiotics has become a globally established uh, scientific fact. And, uh, ISAP recognizes inulin and oligofructose as proven prebiotic in their consensus statement. Looking at the definition of a prebiotic today, it says a prebiotic is a substrate that is selectively utilized by host microorganisms conferring a health benefit. So in order to qualify as a prebiotic, a substance needs uh, the proper scientific evidence from well-controlled clinical trials to prove both elements of this definition. On one side, the selective effect on the microbiota with an increase in beneficial bacteria, such as bifidobacteria, and the link of these uh, or a change uh, in an acknowledged marker for a related health benefit. As of today, there are only three proven prebiotics that fulfill these criteria, and this is shown here. So we have inulin, oligofructose, which is also called fructooligosaccharides, FOS, and galactooligosaccharides, GOS. So this table illustrates the long list of health benefits evidence with high quality human intervention studies for those three proven prebiotics. And on the other hand, it shows a list of what I would call potential candidates that still have uh, a way to go when it comes to the health benefit scientific evidence linked to it. So today, today in the market we have a huge choice of non-digestible carbohydrates and dietary fibers available 
for the development of foods and drinks. And some of these even claim prebiotic properties. Uh, where, however, not every dietary, dietary fiber is a prebiotic, or not every substance making such a claim has uh, the science uh, to prove it. So in order to fulfill the criteria for the prebiotic definition, according to ISEP, it is not enough to show the selective increase in beef bacteria, also the link to a relative health or to a related health benefits need to be shown in a well-designed randomized clinical trials. Chicken root fibers are established prebiotics, so the question is what's, what makes them unique? Um, and here we can see chicken root fibers, inulin and oligofructose are plant-based dietary fibers. Inulin naturally occurs in many fruits, with particularly high content of chicory root fibers, and is obtained from chicory root by hot water extraction, and it consists of oligo and polysaccharides, which are not digested by human enzymes in the small intestine, and which are fully fermentable in the large intestine. As established prebiotics, chicory root fibers selectively feed beneficial bacteria in the gut, such as bifidobacteria, and show related benefits for health, including, among others, digestive health and the support of normal bowel function. So how can we explain that chicory root fibers su support selectively the growth of bifidobacteria? Well, bifidobacteria have the enzymes to cut the better two bond linkages in chicory root fibers and use the resulting fructose as energy source. The bacterial fermentation of fructans uh, let bifidobacteria grow in numbers and produce short-chain fatty acids and other metabolites which interact with the human body and stimulate normal bowel function. Or they produce metabolites during prebiotic fermentation which communicate directly or indirectly with immune cells and the immune system or with the nervous system and the brain via the gut brain acts, which has effects on cognition and mood, or with the hormone system and the release of gut hormones that are involved in the regulation of hunger, satiety, and more. So the outreach is immense and the effects on various health outcomes are in many cases still subject of exploration and scientific research. But what we can be certain of today is that chicken root fibers are the best researched prebiotic ingredients nowadays. So extensive research exists for more than 20 years with strong scientific evidence from a large body of human intervention studies for its effects on the microbiota, digestive health and beyond. In scientific terms, a systematic review with a meta-analysis is the highest level in the hierarchy of scientific evidence. And such a review, such a systematic review, has just been published in 2022, so earlier this year, for chicory root fibers, and this confirms the prebiotic properties. So evidence from as many as 50 human intervention studies has been included, which demonstrates that chicory root fibers significantly increase B phytobacteria selectively, with intake levels of 3 gram per day or more. And significant improvements of bowel function have, has been confirmed as well, demonstrating a related health benefit. Well-designed human intervention studies further demonstrate that chicken root fibers can improve digestive health and inner well-being. So in this re research, consuming chicken root fibers daily has shown benefits for both sides. The microbiota composition on one side, with the selective growth of beneficial bacteria and the inhibition of potential pathogens. And on the other side, bowel regularity with an increased stool frequency and less often hard stools. Both of these sites are interlinked and both have shown to improve inner well-being with a higher satisfaction rating. And in fact, this research addressed here has been key for the approval of a digestive health claim in the EU. Prebiotic chicory root fiber has shown to support many health, uh, has shown to support human health in many more ways beyond their selective increase in bifidobacteria. It has positive effects on parameters of bone function, blood glucose management, or bone health, 
It strengthens inner defense and it helps to manage energy intake and body weight in the natural way. This chicory wood fiber uh, map illustrates the periodic benefits and an outreach to various health aspects and shows the complexity of it when we build it up. So first of all, there is a periodic concept with uh, chicory wood fiber fermentation and selective microbiota growth and related aspects. Secondly, there is improvement in quality of life with questions of regularity, feeling digestion, IBS and inflammation, and there's a gut brain X and mood and well-being. And third, uh, there is a role in metabolic health and the areas of weight management, blood glucose management, lipid metabolism and so on. Also calcium absorption, bone health is, is an area, the relevance to healthy aging, or the role in maternal nutrition and outreach uh, to the next generation. Seeing the complexity, we can expect to see even more aspects in the coming years. Areas of emerging science at the moment around the prebiotic health benefits are, for instance, their role in immunity or uh, the effects on mood and cognition, or uh, effects on metabolic health and others. Um, having this in mind, it gives great opportunities now and in future to develop even more new and innovative foods and drinks with established prebiotics from chicory root and to have uh, and to combine these with attractive messages to consumers. Looking at messages, uh, here we have some examples how such products and communication may look like. The marketing concept on the top shows a dairy-free yogurt alternative with prebiotic chicken root fibers that cares for both the planet and human health. Messages like dairy-free and plant-based address the growing consumer trend for sustainability and attract those who follow a flexitarian or vegetarian diet. Benefits for digestive health and inner well-being are highlighted here with reference to the approved digestive health claim for prebiotic chicken root fiber in Olean in the EU. And also the marketing concept for a breakfast milk drink on the right side shows examples for communication with a plant-based prebiotic fiber inulin and the benefits it has for promoting uh, digestive health and inner well-being. The third marketing concept illustrates the idea of, of a confectionery product. So it shows a gummy candy with a liquid center containing fruit juice and it claims to be sugar reduced and high in prebiotic fiber that promotes digestive health and well-being. So all these concepts uh, and all these examples make use of the fact that Benio's chicory wood fiber inulin has an authorized health claim in digestive health and regularity support that can be communicated on PEC. Prebiotic chicory wood fibers can easily be used in a wide variety of food and drink products dairy products and dairy alternatives or confectionery highlighted before are just some examples. And with the physiological, uh, the physical chemical properties and physiological benefits, chicken wood fibers allow to create great tasting products uh, with prebiotic properties in many main product categories such as breakfast cereals and baked goods, savory foods, or baby food and specialized nutrition, to name just a few. So we warmly invite you to check our website for more information uh, or contact us for further insights uh, in case of interest. We would be happy to. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Mike and Antje, for some really great presentations there. Uh, and we have now some time for some questions. So as mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, please feel free to use the question box in your control panel to submit any questions you may have for our speakers. And remember, please address who the questions are for. So we actually have our first question, Antje. So what is the difference between a prebiotic and a probiotic? Oh, that's a good question, an important question, and I'm happy to respond to that because we see that 
a lot of consumers out there uh, are struggling with the difference of prebiotic and probiotic and these terms used. So let me try to explain it in, in some simple terms maybe. Um, starting with a probiotic, when we talk about a probiotic, we, we are referring to a living organism that convey a benefit to human health when we consume adequate amounts of it. It's, so it's a probiotic microorganism um, that are not necessarily part of our natural uh, microbiota. Uh, it can be a very specific strain that is grown outside and then we consume these with foods uh, and add this particular strain to the gut microbiota uh, inside. So challenge is uh, that such, such strains really stay permanently in the gut often they pass through while, uh, after a while and then you need to consume, need to be consumed regularly uh, for renewal. So if I should put that in a nutshell, I would say probiotic is consumed as a living microorganism that becomes a transient visitor to our natural gut microbiota, let's put it this way. <laughs> um, the idea for prebiotic is a bit different, as I, I tried to outline uh, before my presentation. So prebiotics are food components such as chicken root fibers, which feed the natural microbiota we have inside, and thereby selectively, particularly support the growth of the good bacteria, such as bifidobacteria, linked with benefits to health. Um, so we have a natural microbiota inside, which develops already during birth and stays with us uh, during the lifetime. So keeping this in balance is important uh, because it shows relevance to, to, to us and to our health. So in fact, we should treat it well and we can do so by regularly feeding it uh, with prebiotic fibers. Um, and while the consumption of such prebiotic fibers also adds to dietary fiber intake, uh, which is another benefit, in fact, this does not work vice versa. So not every dietary fiber also has a benefit of a prebiotic. And I think I come back to the story I, I told you before. Uh, we have the three established prebiotics uh, which exist today and that fulfill the criteria. So in a nutshell, prebiotics help us to feed our natural microbiome with benefits to health and prebiotic chicory root fibers help us to do so with the science in place to demonstrate efficacy. Or when I put it in even more layman words, with a prebiotic you can feed your little friends inside which do you good. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. I think that's... Thank you so much, Antje. <laughs> so we have, our, we have our next question. So how did you make the causality link between the microbiota modulation and the health benefit observed? Um, we did that. I think that is, uh, we know that there are, uh, the, the gut fermentation plays a role and the metabolites, short-chain fatty acids and metabolites that are produced thereof. And there is a mechanism, we know that some of these metabolites directly have effects on the stool regularity, uh, on bowel regularity and so on in a nicely drawn uh, mechanism, which we uh, had part of our submission for the health claim because we have uh, yeah, a stool regularity health claim submitted in the EU and approved in the EU and this mechanism was in fact part of the approval so it was accepted by EFSA as showing a link between the prebiotic fermentation and the uh, stool regularity benefit uh, in humans. Perfect, thank you so much. Mike, we have a question for you now. So how will rising prices affect the prebiotic market in 2023. Will consumers still be willing to sort of purchase these products? Yeah, it's it's a great question, and I think um, a question that kind of every health and wellness brand um, is is asking at the moment. We are um, entering a period of a cost of living crisis. We know that it's likely to get much worse before it starts to get better. And I've said many consumers will have to make difficult choices over the next 12 months or so. Now, what we're actually seeing at the moment is that certain um, health and wellness markets are proving to be 
um, relatively uh, resilient uh, to rising costs at the moment. Um, and, and one of the trends that we touch upon, one of the sub-trends for our top 10 trends for 2023 is called health is wealth. And what happens during a cost of living crisis, obviously consumers have to prioritize what they purchase. They'll, they'll cut down on non-essentials. They'll question whether something offers value for money or not. They'll show a greater willingness to um, shop around. And they'll also engage in something called high-low consumerism where they'll actively look to save money on certain products to justify spend elsewhere. The products where they justify the extra spend are those products that align closest with their need states. And as mentioned, we know that consumers are taking this proactive approach to health. We know that COVID-19 has fundamentally changed the way that consumers think about their health. It's put that greater emphasis on long-term health. And what we'll see is consumers continue to purchase products. Now, what they'll do is they'll be more selective what they purchase. So that goes back to the whole thing of the product need to align with their core need states. Um, it needs to have multifunctional claims. It needs to be associated with um, general health and wellness it needs to be a product that can be incorporated into daily diets um easily but then absolutely crucial and crucial for something that's been referenced in both presentations is the importance of efficacy and that backed up with science-based information so consumers will continue to purchase uh, they'll prioritize their health they'll have that added incentive that if you're going to cut down on certain products they'll do it on on product categories that are less healthy overall um but what will be crucial is that consumers will will focus more on value for money meaning it's absolutely crucial to um leverage perceptions of efficacy thank you mike thank you and here we have another question for you so is it possible to label inulin as a chicory root fiber <laughs> thank you for the question and i think it's a good question because i can see the uh, attractiveness to use the term chicken wood fiber product levels it's nicely uh, it's a nice way to expect the natural plant-based origin here i think i would check uh, or verify country by country with specific regulations. Uh, but overall, I think a nicely described effect where it is based on. So if we remember, inuli naturally occurs on a number of plant and, uh, plants and vegetables, and chicory root is particularly rich a source. We obtain uh, inulin uh, by gentle extraction from chicory root. Oligofructose is then derived from inulin. Uh, by partial enzymatic hydrolysis, so a process that also occurs naturally in, in chicory wood fibers during the later harvest period. And while inulin and oligofructose are the very specific names which you often find in ingredients, I think chicory wood fibers accurately describes the source of the fiber from chicory, chicory wood as well. Perfect, Ante. And Ante, we have another question for you as well. So, in what kind of products is inulin or oligofructose used? Um, yeah, well, thank you. Uh, a good question again. So, uh, a few examples uh, I've already shown in the presentation. Inulin and sugar root fibers are quite versatile ingredients, so fitting to many applications. Uh, I'm not the technical expert here, but the ingredient is used in different applications from dairy to bakery and confectionery. And this is because it's not only improving the nutritional profile uh, by adding fiber, uh, being the prebiotic, uh, but also because it has unique texturizing properties, it gives a creamy texture and reduces and replaces fat. Uh, it also is, has a slightly sweet taste, which makes it suitable to re reduce sugar content in many applications and to replace sugar for the benefit of a lower blood glucose response, for instance. This is another claim we have established in, in the EU here. Beyond that, we also sell organic certified inulin, which is grown in the fields uh, close by the Belgian plant and Benio. Uh, has seen a growing demand due to the unique health benefits, health, nutritional and technical properties. Uh, and because of this, our company made many investments lately to increase the production capacity and uh, to answer the growing interest from the uh, industry side. Perfect, thank you. And Mike, we have another question for you. 
So how can brands best communicate scientific evidence around efficacy? Well, it's, um, it's something that can, is, is relatively complex because consumers can demonstrate somewhat contradictory attitudes. Um, firstly, they want an avalanche of scientific information to support claims. They want clinically proven information. They want justification of the claims made. They also want information to be as simple as possible so that they can make um, an informed decision in um, a matter of seconds. So what I would say is that the, the most effective way to do it is to communicate it through um, a variety of channels. So it's not just a case of having the information in one specific place, but having it on packaging, having it at the point of sale displaced, um, and then also having it on the website. So on packaging, the information needs to be relatively straight to the point. Just a couple of lines. We know that consumers tend to spend no longer than 10 seconds evaluating a product. So just some right to the point information backed up. But then, you know, things such as QR codes where they can access the information or additional information at the point of sale display. So that if they want to, um, they can often then read it further. Because with things like this, it's always important to recognize that if the information's there, consumers may not always read it, but they know it's there. If it's not there, they'll question why. So it's very much about having layers from at the point of sale, having it re relatively simple, straightforward, but then also to the point to then backing it up with wider information online. Perfect, Mike. I think we have time for one last final question, and this is this is open for you, Mike, and, and you, Antje, as well. So how influential do you think the gut microbiome will be on the health and wellness market over the next five years? Well, I, I, I think it'll be massive. Uh, I'll just qu quickly um, give my views before Antje passes hers. I mean, we're hearing it more and more in the industry now, you know, um, and consumers are becoming, you know, more and more aware of it. You know, five years ago, if you asked consumers about digestive health issues, they would have treated them in isolation. You know, it causes me feelings of embarrassment. I can't get to sleep. You know, it's impacting on my ability to, to perform daily tasks. But now consumers are actually going um actually you know this is something that impacts on my long-term health um and i think we'll see this more and more we'll see it more and more in the medical industry we'll see it more and more on health and wellness products uh and consumers will become more and more aware of it they they, they kind of under, understand the underlying principle already which is really important because it means consumers will become more accepting when they hear about the specific science consumers know the underlying principle but this is something that's going to govern so many areas of health and wellness over um, the last next five years, particularly as more and more research is being done showing the holistic link between the gut microbiome and overall health. If, if you uh, allow me to add, I couldn't agree more, in fact, Mike, uh, because we see the, the rising increase, uh, the massively increase in interest in the microbiome. Um, in research as well, the number of publications is going up uh, immense. Um, and this shows just that we just at the beginning to understand further and further which other roles the microbiota and the microbiome has uh, for the human health, the outreach to the immune system, the outreach to the brain. You mentioned a lot of this, Mike, already. I mentioned a few of them in, in my presentation. So only starting to understand, I expect also to come more in future. We already know and get the feeling today that it is an exciting uh, area where we can already today, of course, uh, get the benefit of prebiotics uh, and there's even more to come in future. So I also see this as uh, a trend is not even enough to say as, a, as, a, as an important development for future. Perfect. Thank you both, Mike and Ante, again. So I believe that's actually all we have time for now. So if you did ask a question, uh, we'll make sure to respond to this now on email. So thank you all again for coming to the webinar. And as mentioned, this webinar has been recorded and will be available online in the next couple of days. We'll also be sending out an email update with the link to the recording and to the webinar slides. So please make sure to keep an eye out on for that. So see you all soon and hope you all have a great day. Take care and bye-bye. Thank you.